My name is Vukas Enterzic. I work as a cloud solution architect and as a part of my job I have to prepare different proofs of concepts and demos. However, I often forget to delete or deallocate these resources and my test environment in Azure quickly runs out of credit. Because of that, I came up with a lazy way for deactivating it. In this lightning demo, I'm going to show you how to execute your PowerShell scripts with a voice command through your favorite voice assistant. This solution will work with Alexa, Google, Cortana and Siri. Here is how that is going to work. We are going to use a service, if this then that, to transform voice command coming from your favorite voice assistant to action that will execute your script by calling a webhook. In this example, I will use it to run my runbook in Azure Automation account, but same scenario can be used for triggering your pipeline in Azure DevOps or GitHub Actions, or with any other service that supports webhooks or service hooks. Here is my runbook. It was created from a PowerShell script, and it is configured to accept parameters from a webhook. First parameter is action, which we will use to define if the demo environment will need to be started or stopped. Second parameter is a number, which will be used as a postfix identifier for our resource group. This simple example script will then get all VMs in that resource group and start them or stop them depending on the provided input. Now let's publish this runbook. Once we have that, we need to create a webhook for it. That's simple. First, give your webhook a name, make sure it's enabled, configure desired expiration date, and most importantly, copy the URL. The webhook will expect some parameters, but we are not going to enter these now. We will get back to that later. So let's click OK and create our webhook. Now that we have that, let's try to call this webhook with invoke web request. I created a simple script for that. Here we need to paste the URL of our webhook. Body will contain an action start and lab number one. We need to convert that to JSON and pass that information to our webhook. Let's run it. Success! Job with the following ID should now exist. Let's take a look at the Azure portal. Here it is but it did not start yet. Let's take a quick look at our targeted resource group. Here we can see two VMs and both of them are stopped. Now if I go back, job is already running. We can see that the parameters passed over are correct. Lab number is one and action is start. Task is still running, let's refresh it. Finished. Both VMs should be started now, and we can verify that here. Okay. That was easy, wasn't it? Now comes the fun part. Let's do the same thing with the voice command. For that, we need a free account on if this then that. If you don't already have one, go ahead and register. This will allow us to have three active applets, which is enough for our demo. As if this action, we are going to use our voice assistant. With this method, you can use Google, Cortana or Alexa. You will not find Siri here, because that works with the Siri shortcuts instead, but it's still easy to figure it out. I'm going to use Google, because that is easy to demonstrate with an app. Here we need to select the type of the phrase. I will use a phrase with a number and text so we can pass our parameters. If you don't need to pass parameters, 
you can use a simple phrase instead. Now we need to define what we are going to say. I will have it constructed like this. Please, then a dollar sign that represents the text part of the phrase, then demo lab, and then a hash sign for a number. Second option would be please start demo one. And I want Google to respond back like this. Performing start of demo lab one. Let's create a trigger. Then that is what happens after. For the action, we are going to use a webhook. The URL is the URL of our webhook that we created before. The method is post and the content type is JSON. For the body, we need that converted body that we passed to our invoke web request earlier. I'm going to just go back and copy the content of our body variable. Paste that back here. And now we need to replace our values with those from the voice command. Number field goes here. And the text field here. Let's create action. And because we have a trigger and action now, we can finish creating our applet. I'm going to test that out on my phone now. Stop demo lab one. Performing stop of demo lab one. Okay, that was successful. Let's see what is happening in our Azure portal. New job is here. Webhook data received correct values, but with spaces, so you need to have that removed in the code. Let's hit the refresh and the task was completed successfully. We can also see that VMs are now stopped again. That is all for this lightning demo. I hope you liked it and I would love to hear back from you about your creative use cases. Hello, my name is Kevin Knox. This is my lightning demo, building your first container, PowerShell in a box. This demo is just meant to give you a, a brief overview of containers, specifically Docker, and how they work with PowerShell. So this is going to be a quick run through where I show you how to spin up a container, how to build your own container, and put your own scripts or code in it to run. It'll be very brief run through just to get you going, but don't expect this to be anything really in depth, especially not in a lightning talk. I'll start by just going over what is a container. A container is a way to basically standardize code deployment. You can wrap up your code, your prereqs, everything like that that you would need, put them into a container and deploy them anywhere where containers uh, are able to run. If you wanted to run code on a, a server, you would typically split a server up into multiple servers into virtual machines. You'd have a hypervisor level and you'd have to install multiple uh, guest operating systems for each application. In the Docker paradigm, that's not the case. 
you have a single host operating system and Docker interacts between the applications and the operating system to make each application think that it's living by itself. This makes it really easy to move code around, run it in multiple places, and not really have to worry about certain versions of operating systems. And there are some cases where the version matters, but it becomes very OS independent. And when you wrap all your prereqs up with the application, it becomes self-contained. You can definitely go out here on the Docker website. They have a ton of great information on it. To get started with containers, you do need to install Docker. On Windows, you can just get Docker Desktop, and it uses either the Windows subsystem for Linux or Hyper-V in order to virtualize Linux or create a run space for your containers. So even running the Windows containers, it runs inside of Hyper-V. That's the basics of containers and what they are. Like I said, it's a lightning demo, so get out there and find some more information on your own. Docker.com is a great resource for that. So let's actually get to the demo portion of this. And you'll see here, these are just some notes that I have so just to keep me on track. But we're gonna walk through some different things in Docker. When you're using Docker on Windows, you have both a Windows and a Linux side to things. So I'm gonna take you through both of those. Also, take note of when you build stuff in Windows, you build containers in Linux, they're just in those environments. So you'll have to build Windows specific things or Linux specific things. And you need to worry about those if you're doing paths, case sensitivity, and and the file path. You're not gonna have your C drive, for instance, when you're in the Linux um, space. So you just need to take note of that and just make sure you realize which environment you're in and you know how that's gonna differ. Another thing you'll notice with Windows versus Linux images, and we'll see this here in a second, is the size. Linux images tend to be significantly smaller than Windows images. I'm gonna start off, I have Docker Desktop installed, and I'm gonna run a pretty basic command, just Docker info. Tell me about the, the installation of Docker that I'm running right now. And you'll see here, these two lines tell you a little bit about what operating system you're running. You can see here that I'm in Linux because it's Docker Desktop and the Windows subsystem for Linux 2. I'll show you right now, I'm just running in a PowerShell a window. So if I do PS version table, I'll see that I'm running in Windows 10 and uh, PowerShell 713. I'll also show you here all of the Docker images that I have. An image is going to be packaged up application that you're going to deploy as part of a container. Here you'll say I have the PowerShell image and that's the only thing I have. It's the basic one from Microsoft. If I want to go ahead and run that image, and these will pull on the fly if they're not available locally, I'm going to run this Docker run IT for interactive, the name of the container, and I want to be at a PowerShell prompt. So I'm going to do PWSH at the end there so that it brings me right into PowerShell. In here, I can run PS version table again. You'll see when I do this that now it's Linux specific. So you can see that I'm running in the Linux OS. I'm with Windows subsystem for Linux 2, and I'm still in PowerShell version 713. That's just because it's the latest version. I can exit right back out of there. I can do the same thing over on the Windows side. So one thing to note, I mentioned the file sizes. PowerShell is 324 megs on the Linux side. Let's go ahead and switch over to Windows containers. And we should see here, if it's done, my OS and my kernel are now Windows specific. Docker image list. I have PowerShell image is six gigs. So six gigs compared to 300 megs uh, is quite a difference. So typically, if you're able to do it, put your containers in Linux, they're smaller, they're easier to use and consume. I'm gonna run the same command I did before. So I'm gonna go into an interactive session. I'm going to run PS version table. And you'll see here, it looks very much the same as my local system, I'm just running in a container now. And I can see the command prompt changed. I'm at the C prompt instead of in my container directory that I created. 
and you'll see in C there's not a lot of stuff here. It's a very empty system because it's a container. If I exit out of that, um, you see my path that I'm in now is completely different. So let's switch back to Linux because we're going to build a Linux-based container here. And let's dig into the Docker file. I'm showing a very basic example of one here. This is the language that tells Docker when you're building your own container what to do. But the first line here tells it start by pulling from the PowerShell image that's out there. This is from Microsoft's registry. Then copy in from my local directory test.ps1 to the temp directory. And then you should execute this um, command here, which is to run that test.ps1 file. And that file is very basic. It's just going to write, you have built a container. So once I've done that, and I have those files, and they're all in, in my directory that I'm working in, I can do the Docker build, give it a, a tag with a unique name that I want to give it. So I'm going to call it local example script 1.0.0. And then this period right here is very important. That says build in my current directory. If you had a Docker file in another directory, you could point to that. But my Docker file is my local directory. And so that's what it's going to look for. I don't have to tell it it's named Docker file. That's just the default, and that's what it'll look for. When I run this, I already have some of the images on my system. So I didn't have to pull them down. It's a pretty quick process when it, everything's there and cached. I did the first step, which is to pull down that image, and then it copied in my script. It's been packaged up. I can look at it now. There we go. I can see my repository that I created, local example, the tag, script 1.0.0, 1, 1 .0, and I can go ahead and run this now. It says you've built a container. That's what I was expecting as a result from my script. So this is really good if you have scripts that do something, like run a report or something like that, and you just want to wrap them up, and you have a place where you can run containers. You can wrap up a bunch of stuff in there and have it just go out and query a bunch of stuff, do some work, and then shut down. I'm sure you could do something with like WebGIA, things that need to run all the time. You can do that with containers. And instead of running in the interactive mode like I'm doing, as long as the process um, continues, it will continue to run in the background. And you can do detached mode. So it runs it as a, a background process. And as you can see, I didn't get the output here because it's not running interactively. So there's one last thing I want to show you here. And this is how any of your containers are going to reach out to the outside world is through mapping volumes or mapping ports allows you to take local resources, whether it be network resources or files, and map them into the container that you're using. So this one here, I want to map a volume, which is the current volume that we're in, the containers volume, into a path inside the container. And we'll go back into that PowerShell prompt so that we can explore around. As you see here, if I go to flash root, I have my same files, docker, example.txt, test.ps1, inside the container is mapped to this local directory. I could make dir test, and you'll see now I have that test directory, right? I can also rm and now I've removed it. You can map port 80 into your container. So you do dash p 80 colon 80. And the format for this is local resource, remote resource, or internal container resource, however you want to say it. And that's all there is to it. Like I said, this is just a quick overview of containers and how they work, and obviously how they work with PowerShell. I hope you guys look more into containers. There's a lot of information out there on docker.com. Uh, there's also a site called Play With Docker that gives you the ability to just 
learn the basics of containers, and get your hands dirty without having to spin up Docker yourself. Thank you. Hi, my name is Peter Bergerny, and I'm a cloud automation engineer and internal DevOps platform product owner at the University of Minnesota. And I'm here to show you a demo on how we do our end-to-end -end PowerShell module deployment with Azure DevOps. Now, before we get into the demo, I'm going to show a few slides to sort of set the scene. So we're going to start with where we started, move into what the motivations were for making uh, building this, uh, finally a demo, and then end with a few caveats to the process and some closing thoughts. So first of all, where we started. So we have a number of internally developed PowerShell modules, and we're using them on on-premise infrastructure. We've got hybrid runbook workers in Azure Automation, um, some utility servers that we use to run scripts. Um, and these are primarily modules that are interacting with various services and REST APIs for things that we use. Um, the modules were in monolithic PSM1 files. So that means all of the functions in source control were in a single file. And then that's the file that was imported. Um, we would do code reviews with pull requests. Um, so we weren't just uh, yeeting code out. Um, and then when we pushed to master, the code would just be copied to us to our servers via some runbook in Azure Automation. Um, so I had sort of a wish list and called motivations for trying to build out um, a little more robust process. So I wanted the ability to deploy to test environments. The previous state, you could only deploy to production environments. Otherwise, you'd have to copy the files manually somewhere to test them. I wanted to be able to run pester tests against the code. I wanted to just in general use a CI CD process rather, you know, because that's purpose built for deploying code rather than the Azure automation process, which worked, but wasn't really designed for code. Um, I wanted to make this easy for people to do. I wanted a single source of truth for the build definition, which means I didn't want all of the uh, build definition to live within each repository. Um, so that I could say update it once and it would be available to all of the repositories that are using it. Um, part of that is I wanted to include some guardrails automatically. I wanted to make sure that our modules have tests, um, that the modules have the proper help commands, that they're uh, past PS script analyzer rules, things like that. <clears throat> I want to allow some customizations to these guardrails and settings, but also I want to provide sane defaults so that someone is able to get started without needing to do a lot of thinking about what all these settings mean. And finally, I just wanted to automate as much as possible. I wanted this to be really easy for people to use. They just load this up, push their code, and everything happens automatically. I don't want them to think about the tooling or settings or anything like that. Um, I just wanted it to be as simple as possible. So let's go into the demo now. So here we are in Azure DevOps with one of our PowerShell module projects. You can see we've got a pipeline here. It's a pretty simple three-stage pipeline, build, test, and deploy. Now, if we look at the Azure Pipelines YAML file for this project, you can see we've got a trigger. We're going to trigger on any push to any branch, uh, master for the pull requests, specify uh, what kind of VM it runs on, define some variables. Um, you may not have seen this before. We're going to uh, load an external resource, and then finally, we're going to call a template. And so we're gonna pass those variables that were defined above into that template. So if you haven't figured it out by now, this is all using Azure DevOps templates. So the entire, the, uh, the logic of the pipeline is actually defined in this template repository rather than within each individual module. So all it needs to happen is you uh, put this fairly simple Azure Pipelines YAML file in your project, um, specify the correct variables, pass them into the template, and the template does all the work. So let's, uh, you know, it's pretty pretty boring looking at YAML, and to be honest, it's pretty boring looking at uh, even build pipeline results. So we're gonna run through this pretty quickly here. So build stage, so um, gonna install some prerequisites. Uh, we're using Git version to do automatic versioning, so set that up, and then Posh Codes module builder to actually build the module. Um, that's gonna assemble all of our function files into a, uh, single PS1. Um, then on the test stage, 
Um, actually, ab above in the, in the build stage, we're also we're going to publish the pipeline artifact, um, so it's available in subsequent stages, which is important. Um, so here in the test stage, um, again, so we're in a new container environment, so we're going to restore the prerequisites again. Um, download that pipeline artifact because we needed to run tests. Um, we're going to uh, basically generate some test files in a test directory um, to uh, run Power, PowerShell Script Analyzer against the code and ensure that all the individual functions have the necessary help. Um, then we're just going to run pester tests. So it's going to be those tests that we generated here in the pipeline and also any code specific tests that are a part of the module. Um, and then pester is going to generate code coverage and test results. And those are going to get published into the build pipeline. And then finally, we can do a deploy. Now, um, if this is a, t a test build, which means that it's not published to the default branch, which for this particular repository is master, um, <clears throat> we're going to do a deploy to a test environment. And otherwise, we're going to do a deploy to um, both our production and test environments. Um, so this particular build was a, a production build. Um, so here in the deploy stage, we're going to download the pipeline artifact again. Um, and so this part's going to run on an on-premise agent um, because in our case, the, we need to talk to some resources that are only available within our environment. Um, so this is an agent running within our data center. So we're going to, on that system, make, make sure that our PS repository is registered. Right now we're using a file share um, because it's simple, but that can easily be migrated to uh, using a NuGet repository. Um, so register that repository, download any dependencies that are defined in the module, um, publish it to the repository. And then since this was the production build, we're also going to uh, generate a release in GitHub. So we'll um, zip up all the files and then publish the release using GitHub's API. And then um, we do a de deploy. So this is a deployment job. So it's going to look the same on all the systems. So on this particular server, first it's going to make sure the PS repository is registered. It's going to install the module. It's going to grab any external dependencies um, that exist, um, that like so they might be on the PowerShell gallery. And then finally, it's going to just import the module to validate that it worked. So I know, uh, like I said, YAML, YAML demos can be kind of boring, um, but I do just want to briefly show off the actual template files. Um, so if you remember back in the uh, Azure Pipelines file, um, we were going to call umn-module.yaml. Um, and so this is the template. So we're passing in some parameters. So we've defined those parameters. And then actually the way I've written this is uh, that this template actually calls templates itself. Um, so we have stages and jobs defined that call each other. Um, this is, you know, it can be pretty complicated to look at um, kind of a, a complex template situation. Um, it really takes some time to wrap your head around it, but it does make it a lot easier to maintain. Um, it reduces copy and paste of code because I can essentially call something as a function rather than duplicating the code multiple times. Um, but so we have a template for the build stage, a template for the test stage, and a template for the deploy stage. And then the build stage has mostly just steps. Uh, sorry, the build stage, um, everything is contained in it. Um, the deploy stage, if you look closely at it, it does call some more templates. Um, of these steps in the test, I'm doing this all out of order, and the test stage also calls some test steps. Um, and I'll post a link to this because like I said, this can be hard to just stare at all on your own. So I'd like to finish up with a few caveats about all of this. Um, so the, uh, the templates that I showed, those are all open source available on uh, github.com. Um, and I would encourage you to take a look at those um, and I would hope that they are useful as is for you. But these were written for our environment. Um, they've been tested in our environment. In other words, it works on my machine. I can't guarantee that there's not issues, assumptions I've made that I haven't documented, something like that. Um, but this is open source, so you know, you're free to copy this and modify it for your own use. Or even better, if you find an issue that I haven't uh, considered, make a pull request and uh, help it out. Um, I know there are a lot of rough edges here. Um, this is definitely a minimally viable product. It, uh, it works for what we need it to do. Um, and it's, it's still very much a work in progress and an ongoing work. Um, 
So um, if you want to reach out to me, I'm on Twitter as Fishman Pet, um, and I will provide links to um, the GitHub repository and uh, hopefully a little more explanatory blog post. Um, so this is a URL shortener that our university runs. So z.umn.edu slash PSH Summit 2021. And that'll be uh, some more information that hopefully you can find useful. Um, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Camille and I am an Azure consultant at Perdica. I will tell you how to solve an issue that many organizations deal with. If you are a project owner in the organization and start a new project, you need some resources. For example, you need a tool like Azure DevOps to plan your work, store code and automate deployments. Your infrastructure resources must belong to Azure subscription. Developers in your team need permissions. The budget must be controlled. You also need to request for infrastructure resources dedicated to your project. It usually takes some time and involves many teams. You need to wait even longer if more projects are starting in parallel. This problem can be solved by a solution that I will tell you about. It is a self-service system for project owners where they can request all required assets to start the project. Thanks to automation, it is a matter of minutes. We use Azure Pipelines to handle it. It can be triggered via API, so it's easy to integrate with anything else. The inputs are the name of the project, environment, budget, list of project owners, and information on whether the external employees are involved in the project. These parameters will be used to create and configure everything what the developer and project owner needs. We start by assigning an Azure subscription to this project. We set the subscription name and we move it to the proper management group. Appropriate roles and Azure policies are assigned there to ensure resources are configured uh, there following our standards. We set the appropriate tags at the subscription level and thanks to Azure policy, they will be propagated to all the resources below in the hierarchy. We use Terraform to manage projects in Azure DevOps and groups in Azure AD that give developers access to the project. The changes are implemented in the infrastructure as a code approach. Our primary process pushes an additional file in the repository that triggers the Terraform pipeline. Terraform creates groups in Azure AD that gives access to the Azure DevOps project, the Azure subscription assigned to this project, and for example, to SonarCube instance. It also allows connecting to the dedicated gateway for that project. Most importantly, a project owner manages developer group membership on his own. He can add users from the organization and external ones invited to the tenant. We use Microsoft Identity Management to create an organizational unit in the dev domain for each project and the security group with developer members. Memberships is mirrored to the Azure AD group managed by the project owner. It grants admin privileges for virtual machines in the project. Terraform also creates two app registrations, one for service connection in ADO and the second for VPN gateway to provide developers with network access. Our primary process is waiting for the Terraform pipeline to finish. When the ADO project is fully configured and the security principles in Azure ID are created, we can deploy infrastructure resources in the subscription. It's done by the ARM template deployment, for which the parameters are dynamically created. This is a cross-scope deployment because peering or VPN connection must be configured both in hub and project virtual network. Let me show you what is being deployed. Here is our subscription with proper name and tags assigned. At the subscription level, we configure the budget and its monitoring. The project owner will be informed by email after every 10% of the budget has been used. We also grant the proper permissions to the developer group and service connection that Terraform created earlier. We create resource groups to maintain the correct resource hierarchy. Recovery Service Vault with backup policy is also a part of the deployment. 
our environment already consists of some part of shared infrastructure. Including central log analytics and virtual network hub with domain controllers, antivirus, ADFS, and express route gateway, which connects to on premises. We connect all projects to the hub by peering if there is no external vendor there or VNet to VNet site to site VPN otherwise. Before creating a virtual network, we calculate network addressing based on the address space used in virtual networks in projects that have been created so far. Virtual network and subnets are created with the appropriate network security groups and route tables assigned. We deploy a dedicated virtual network gateway through which the point-to-site connections will be able to be established but only by the user selected by the project owner. We use BGP to propagate routes for which the ASN is dynamically computed. After completing this process, the project owner has everything he needs. Now we want to access all created resources in the project and virtual machines as a developer that is a part of the project. At the moment, the developer does not see anything after logging into Azure and after logging to the Azure DevOps. Guess what? The project owner can do it on his own. Now he's adding access for developer using my access portal. Now developer can access Azure and resources in the subscription. If you want to access one of the project virtual machines, for example, over RDP, he can set up a point to side VPN connection to a dedicated gateway that is dedicated to this particular project. It's simple. He can download the configuration file, configure the client, connect, login to the virtual machine. Of course, developer can also access Azure DevOps portal and the project. We've just reduced to a minimum the time between the decision to start or migrate a project to the cloud and the moment when the developer and project owner can start working on it. Thank you. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me directly. Hello. I'm Dave Carroll, and this Summit 2021 Lightning Talk is entitled Automating Updates to a Changelog. When I began writing PowerShell modules and wanted to share them with the community, I first examined how others accomplished that task. One of the things that stood out was that in many projects, I saw a highly detailed changelog, often with linked to GitHub releases and GitHub issues. I quickly set this as a goal for my own projects. After some researching, I found a site called Keep a Changelog, which prescribes guidelines on what should be included in a changelog. I then spent a little time and wrote PS Changelog Tools module. It uses the project's local Git log and queries GitHub for release tags and issues. Because of these last two, it requires the module PowerShell for GitHub. Now let's take it out for a spin. Once we import the module, let's review the functions. We'll be using all but git, git log directly. It is used by git change log update. Now I want to create a hash table of parameters for git change log update. We can examine the parameters a little closer using git help. We can see that the release type and update required parameters have validation sets. Since this requires a Git project, we need to set the location to the project folder.
once there we can run get change log update Let's see what was returned. You can see where some of the parameters are used in the header. The sections such as fixed and added are taken from keep a change log guidelines. The output is in markdown. You can see that each entry includes a GitHub issue number, a link to the issue, and the title of the issue. I haven't mentioned it until now, but for this to work, there are a few important aspects to keep in mind. You need to create an issue for anything that you want included in the change log. You also need to add the appropriate change log type to the beginning of your commit message. For example, fix number two. We should also close the issue in GitHub. Third, if you have a release link, it will be included at the bottom of this change log update. And lastly, GitHub release tags are used to know where to look for change log updates. If you do not create GitHub releases, this command will always return entries for all commits. Next, we will add this changelog update to the changelog. I'm going to create another hash table that I can use for splatting later. I'll also be using the changelog path in the next command. Next, we'll add the changelog update to the changelog. Next, let's see the git diff for this file. So you can see that the changelog has been updated. It's adding this section. And if we keep going down, we see that uh, it's just this section, and it was added on top. Get out of that. We will then get the updated release notes string. This will be used to replace the existing release notes in the module manifest. Note that the only change log entries for the last release will be included in the release notes. That's why I've added the statement for the full change log to the end of the output. Lastly, we are going to replace the existing release notes using the update module manifest. And that's it for this lightning talk. If you're interested in using this module, it's available as a GitHub gist at the following link. At the keep a change log link, you'll find proper change log guidelines. Thank you for your time, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of Summit. Hi, I'm Glenn Sarty, a lead consultant at Telstra Purple, and I don't like meetings. I'm sure you've had some of the same experiences as me, the meeting where you and your colleagues are in a room and your boss just talks at you, or the meeting where two people just dominate the entire thing and don't let other people talk, or the classic meeting of why am I even here? None of this is useful for me. I wonder what's for lunch. And yet, there have been a small number of meetings where they're fantastic, where we got together and discussed issues and came out with ideas on how we could fix them or you had a really intense and honest chat in your one-on-one -on -one meetings. Why is it that we hate meetings and yet they can be so useful and even critical for teams to work better? So some companies have introduced, you know, meeting-free Thursdays, and all that does is increase the number of meetings on days that aren't Thursday. Or some companies say, no meeting shall be longer than 25 minutes, but that just meant meetings were rushed or you just had more of them. Some companies make the meeting more structured. You know, all meetings must have an agenda. They should be recorded in a document and there should be action items assigned at the end. But then people just focus on the meeting process, but not about actually talking about things. So changing the frequency or the length of the meetings didn't really matter. Adding too much structure made the meetings less useful. But you can't just have undetermined length meetings with no agenda. There has to be some limitations. 
So how can we have enough structure in a meeting, but still make them engaging for people? And that's where Lean Coffee began. So Lean Coffee started back in 2009 in Seattle with Jim Benson and Jeremy Lightsmith, and they wanted to start a group that would discuss lean techniques and knowledge work. But they didn't want to start a whole new cumbersome organization with steering committees and speakers and everything. So instead, Lean Coffee is a structured but agendaless meeting where the participants gather and build an agenda and then begin talking. So the conversations are directed and productive because the agenda for the meeting was democratically generated. So how does a Lean Coffee meeting work? So first, you're going to need some paper to write down topics and some pens and some people to talk to. Now, given we're still in a pandemic, we may not be able to meet in person, and that's fine. There are many free tools out there that do Kanban boards like Trello or even GitHub projects and video conferencing apps like Zoom or Teams. So you'll have three columns, to discuss, discussing, and discussed. Next, everyone writes down topics they would like to discuss and adds them to the to discuss column. When you feel there are enough topics, people can quickly talk about their topics, you know, one or two sentences, so everyone knows what the topic is about. Next, everyone votes for the topics they're interested in. Everyone gets two or three votes and you just put dots or marks on the cards. You can put all your votes on one topic or spread them out. You don't even have to vote for your own topic. It's up to you. The votes are then tallied and then you start talking about the topic with the most votes. When that topic is exhausted, you move on to the next and so on. Now, this seems like a simple process and it kind of is. But because the people in the meeting build the agenda, they are engaged and they want to contribute to the discussion. And the topics in the meeting are things that people want to talk about or listen to. And these simple things make the meetings useful and engaging. And there are some variations as well. Some meetings actually add an actions column where you write down actions that people need to do after the meeting. That way things don't get forgotten. And then sometimes one topic can dominate the meeting and people become disengaged and bored. So what you can do is every two minutes or so, you pause the discussion and have a quick vote. Everyone quickly votes with thumbs up to continue or thumbs down to stop. If the majority wants to continue, then the topic stays. If the majority wants to stop, then the next topic is picked. Now this may seem like the group is silencing people, but it turns out people can just leave the current conversation and start another group elsewhere. You're not stuck in this one group. Groups can shrink, they can enlarge, they can split off or just disappear. It's the discussion, the topics that drive the groups of people, not the other way around. And these lean coffee techniques are used elsewhere as well. The popular DevOps Days conference uses a lean coffee style for their agenda called open spaces. In the morning, in the morning people put up topics and then during the lunch break, people can vote on those topics. And then in the afternoon, the topics are assigned rooms in the conference space and people go there to talk about it. Now imagine that, a conference agenda built by the attendees. And Patrick Lencioni wrote about a similar technique in his book, Death by Meeting, to help executives, like CEOs, hold better meetings. In his weekly tactical meeting, he talks about a lightning round where attendees very briefly discuss their top priorities, and then they build a real-time agenda for discussion. And these are the same principles and practices of Lean Coffee for CEOs. But Patrick does have another point. There are different meeting types for different occasions. And you probably don't want to use Lean Coffee for your all hands or your town hall meetings. So it's not like an end to all of those horrible meetings. But Lean Coffee can at least help with some of those more common boring ones that you have. So with that, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. You can find me on Twitter at Glenn Sarty and look forward to hearing about your first Lean meeting. See ya. Hello, my name is Kevin Locks. This is my lightning demo, Reaching Your Breaking Point, Learning to Troubleshoot Code. I am a platform engineering manager and tend to be a resource at my company for troubleshooting. I find that you know, I often get emails or people reaching out to me saying, hey, I'm having trouble with this code. Can you help me figure out what's going on? One thing I, I noticed is that while I've done a lot of teaching of PowerShell at my company and previous companies I've worked for, 
I never really showed people how to debug their code and use the tools that are available to you. There's debug mode in PowerShell, um, ISC, Visual Studio Code, and that you can even use in the command line to troubleshoot your code. And I wanted to share that with you today. Let's get started. But this code here is essentially just going to go through this loop and I'll show you the current results of it. And it works, it completes, but it, one of the results I get back is failure, which is not really what I'm expecting. I want it to be success. I'm going to take you through the process of troubleshooting. And the thing that you want to start with is a breakpoint. You've probably seen this before. Maybe you accidentally set it. But if you don't know what a breakpoint is, it's essentially a way to stop code from executing at a point in time, or actually pause it, not stop it, so that you can debug the code, so you can actually dig into it and figure out what's going on that might be causing you a problem. In uh, Visual Studio Code and the ISE, you essentially just click on the side here, and then it goes from being transparent to being uh, solid. And when you go to run your code again, you'll notice that it comes through and it stops at that point. At that breakpoint, we can see that dollar sign number equals one. I have this little watch for dollar sign num less than three. This is something that you could set up when you think you know what might be causing your problem. I know from this script that for some reason, because normally this should be going success it's not equal to true all the time at some point this becomes false and that's probably what's causing my problem what i'm going to do is i'm going to go ahead and step through my code and i'm going to see how i'm getting that error or when i'm getting that error i'm going to use step over to step through my code quickly and i'll see every time i pass one of these i get success 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 but oh, failure i know that failure happened when it went into test bad i know that test bad was the one that threw it i know that i had already set up this watch but maybe if you didn't know that at this point you knew that hey it's from this right host failure that i'm getting that but at some point num is not less than three and i'm going to go ahead and refresh or restart the code here and I'm gonna step back through, but this time, when I get to that third iteration, I'm gonna step into, so I got all my successes down here, I'm gonna step into the code, or into the function, and I'll notice as soon as I get in here, wait a second, my watch says false. If I drill down into the function a little bit more where it's actually doing the evaluation, I'll notice that this time, instead of just writing out success, it went down to the else statement. This did not, this was not true. It didn't evaluate the true. So I went to my else statement and I wrote out failure. How can I fix that? At this point, and this is one of the really cool things about debugging, I can just type things in and I can figure out if they'd work. If I say dollar sign num is maybe less than or equal to three, instead of less than three, I'll find that I get a true now, and maybe that's what I need to do to my code. Now I can fix the code. I can um, clear my breakpoint, rerun the code, and I'll see that everything is fixed now. This is a very basic example of debugging, but you can take this and you can use this on much larger scripts, very much the same way. Step through your functions, find out where they're breaking, look into variables, figure out what the values are at any point in time, run your own commands at a point in time in a script to figure out what's going on, change the value of a script, or a, sorry, a variable in the middle of a script. There's a lot of things you can do in debugging that are really powerful for helping you solve your problems in your script and identify them as well that's basically it for my demonstration as far as the code let me show you how to do a similar thing from the command line while doing this demo i discovered 
Now you can do PS breakpoints at the command line um, instead of just in the ISE. I've never used it. I've used the ISE debugging for years, but then I saw, and I'd seen this before, but I just didn't think twice about it, that you could do a couple of different breakpoint commands. As you'll see here, you have disable, enable, git, remove, and set. And it's pretty easy to actually use the debugging from the command line. So I can do PS set PS breakpoint. There's a couple different options here on how to set your breakpoints, but um, I'm going to stick with line for now because that's what we used before. I can set the um, script that I want to set the breakpoint on. And if I get PS breakpoint, I can see that I now have that um, breakpoint set. When I go to run that script now, I'll notice that I get this yellow text here that says, hey, I hit the line breakpoint on that script, line 19, and it shows me what currently is running in that script. The first time you run it, and I've run this a couple times now, it will tell you that if you want help, you're in the debug mode now. You can hit the H key, and that will give you the help menu. Once you get in here, you'll see you can do similar, similar things before. Step into, over, out, continue, quit. And those are basically just hitting the key and hitting enter. If I want to step into the current function of test good, I can hit S, step into. And now I'm in the test good function, and I continue to you know, step through it. If I want to um, just continue on until I hit another breakpoint, I can hit C, and I can continue on. I can um, find out what my variables are set to at whatever point in the script I'm in. I can step over until the next time I hit the breakpoint. The next part of that, it gives me now the values three here. If I want to step back in, I'm in the test good function. I know that one's fine. Let's see here. Now I'm going to run into the test bad function. And I can say, okay, what's my dollar sign num? Oh, that's equal to false. I can see that's where we found in the ISC, that's where it broke at. You'd be able to basically do the same thing here. And then when you're ready to quit, you can just do Q and quit out of it. It gives you similar functionality to as in the ISC, but it could be useful if you're you're trying to figure out why a script's not working and maybe you don't have access to the ISC or you're running it. I don't know if it works remotely, but I think you have to copy it locally to debug. But I'm not sure that it's going to work remotely. But for some reason, if you are writing a script, you're a command line type person, this might be useful for you. I just think that personally, I'd probably stick to the ISE because there's a lot more, maybe just because I'm more visual, but there's a lot more you can see and do in the debugger from the ISE. But I think it's really cool that this is there, and so I thought I'd show this off as well. That's really all I have for my Lightning demo. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope that it's useful for you and you'll be able to take these tools back to your workplace, and be able to troubleshoot and, and figure out a little bit more about why your, your scripts are causing you problems. My name is Kevin Locks, and thank you again for attending my demo.